You're welcome. Hey, uh, again, my name is Norm Mandrevo, and you guys are, how many, any freshmen? No. Okay, sophomores? Okay, so most, and juniors? Any seniors? Okay. So, so um, and you're learning all about sports medicine and what that involves and things like that. So I'm going to quickly paint a picture. This is what I'll try to do today. I'll, I'll try to paint a picture of the different areas of sports medicine that you can go into, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. And, but I'll also paint a picture of how I got where I am, and, and it might just help you uh, with your path through life. And, and then I'll be open for some questions, and uh, um, you know, we can, I think you're going to do hips next week, and I know your teacher inside and out with regard to hips. And I could, I could tell you about her hips because I replaced both of her hips. So, so um, but, but briefly, let me just paint a picture of sports medicine. Um, when, uh, when you look at the, you know, when you're a high schooler or college student, you look at sports medicine, you go like, sports medicine, what is it? Is it athletic training? Is it uh, like, who's that doctor on the sidelines? You know, what, what's, what are they doing? Uh, what's the difference between a physical therapist who, you know, if you look into physical therapy, you end up with a doctorate in physical therapy. So you're technically a doctor, but are you a doctor doctor? Like what, what is a doctor? And, and, and all that kind of thing. So there's all those kind of questions that you guys will have. And, you know, typically what typically happens is you, you go on to an undergraduate college and, and, you know, for, for the route that I took, I graduated, I was a biology major, um, you know, and I took the pre-med requirements. Pre-med means before medical school. So that typically means that you take a year of biology in college, a year of chemistry, a year of organic chemistry, a year of physics. Some schools have calculus, and those are all prerequisites. My daughter is a senior at IU Medical School this year, and she was an anthropology major. So she studied people for four years, but she did all her pre-med requirements, and you know, she's gonna be a physician. Uh, so, so I just did the kind of typical route, did biology, but you'll understand why I did that in a little bit. And I actually wasn't sure whether I wanted to go to medical school or not, and I have a master's degree in biology because I thought about teaching for a while. But then I decided I was doing a lot of research on, of all things, a little tiny crab. And I did that for two years of my life in my 20s. And one night, this was outside Philadelphia, one night driving to Philadelphia International Airport on a Saturday night to pick up my shipment of Pacific Shore crabs to take back to the lab that night to make sure they survive so I can work on them the next week. I said, this is no life. I can't be doing this the rest of my life. I'm in my 20s, all my other buddies are having a good time and I'm doing crabs on a Saturday night. And that's when I decided to punt and go to medical school so I could work on people. But that's kind of one of the decisions I did. So, so you go to medical school. Um, so let's just talk about MDs or DOs. So medical school's four years and you come out with a degree, you're called a doctor after that, you have an MD after your name. But then the, then the fun starts, you know, there's, there's a zillion things you can go into and still have an MD after your name. And in the sports medicine arena, there's primary care sports medicine or orthopedic surgery sports medicine. And you could probably argue that there's a couple of other areas in medicine where you can subspecialize in, in the treatment of athletes. But what does all that mean? Well, for me, it meant that for five years after medical school, I came out here to IU. I graduated from medical school in Philadelphia. My wife's from uh, North, she graduated North Central High School. Uh, we, um, we knew that back when I was going through, um, like, uh, like it was kind of humorous, my work weeks were some, some years, 120 hour work weeks. And so like, if you do the math, I just want to make sure this is correct. Yeah, so there's 168 hours in the week, okay? And literally, we clocked that I was gone from the house a couple years, 120 hours of the week for multiple weeks at a time, being on call and all that stuff. It's not like that anymore. You have like, you, you only have to work 80 hour weeks when you're a resident, which sounds like a lot to you guys probably, but it's not like 80 hours, a lot less than 120 hours. Um, 
and, and so like I did that for five years of my life, learning surgery, and one of the cool things was, was I got to go to Colts camp in uh, my fourth year of, of residency, which was a really cool thing. I, I'd go with the guy who was the team physician for the Colts at the time, and you know, you'd get to have lunch with the Colts. And have you ever heard this? Anybody know how many calories a football lineman eats in a day? Can you just take a guess? Just throw out a number. How many calories do you eat in a day? So the, the typical person will eat anywhere from 1,200 to 1,800 calories a day. You know what a Colts lineman will put away in a day? 7,000 to 8,000 calories a day. These guys, these guys are horses. It's just kind of fun to watch them eat like, whoa, and the, you know, they're big bodies and all that other stuff. It's not the healthiest thing to do that um, mm -hmm. year round. But when you're burning a lot of calories and sweating a lot, these guys put it away. So it was kind of fun to see that. And then the most humorous part was you, you, we went to the fitness center where the Colts were working out. And you, you got to use the same workout equipment, but, you know, it's just kind of a joke when I'm lifting weights compared to these guys lifting weights. And then I remember being impressed. A couple of the guys had these cars that, you know, you, you, I'm not a car guy, but these really, really nice cars. And I remember a few of the guys had these cars where the alarm system you got too close to the car and the car would start talking to you, please back away from the car. And I just remember all those little memories of Colts camp. But, but anyway, to get back, you finish orthopedics and um, then you can do another year in orthopedics where you just specialize in sports medicine. So what does sports medicine mean? It means the care of the athlete. Like, uh, what do you do as an orthopedic physician when you're on the sidelines for a football game? What do you need to be prepared to do if a guy breaks his neck? if a guy can't breathe, all those kind of acute things. So that's, and then, you know, like, what do you do if a guy breaks a femur? What do you got if breaks an arm? All, all those kind of things that orthopedic surgeons deal with. I don't know if you guys realize, but orthopedics originally means ortho to straighten peds children, orthopedics. It was actually a specialty of medicine that, uh, you know, any of you guys have studied medicine? like in the 1600s and stuff like that, the surgeons of the world were also your local barber. Hey, can I have a haircut and a shave? And by the way, can you take my tumor out of my side? That's kind of like what the barbers did back then. And so the uh, orthopedic surgeons would be these, these guys that, like kids like you, well actually kids that were younger than you, who were still growing their spines, would get tuberculosis and they get tuberculosis of their spine and they'd, they'd get these hideous curves in their spine called scoliosis, these crippling spinal diseases. And these guys were smart enough with leather and wood to actually straighten these kids' spines out as the kids continued to grow. So the, the specialty was called to straighten children, orthopedics, to straighten children. And then as medicine matured and as the barbers stuck with haircuts, and the doctors did the surgery, orthopedics evolved into the care of the musculoskeletal system, your bones and joints. And so that's, that's the history of orthopedics. But like you could graduate from medical school and decide, hey, I wanna, do, I wanna do sports medicine, but in a primary care route. What does that mean? Well, that means you can go to a three-year residency in family practice or internal medicine, and then do your year of sports medicine. So now you're caring for okay, uh, John is a football player, Amber is a swimmer. Uh, they have asthma and they wanna know how, can they, can they play with their asthma and swim and participate fully with chlorinated air and stuff like that. And you would be able to manage those kind of things and manage uh, primary care conditions that don't necessarily require surgery. You'd also be the person on the sidelines to be able to manage at least initially someone who breaks something, a football player who's got a helmet on and has got a potential neck injury, what do you do? And he can't breathe. How do you open his airway? All those kind of things. And then, say you go to college and you really don't want to do the medical school route, you can do the physical therapy route or you can do the athletic trainer route. You could graduate from college and be an athletic trainer and then you're on the sidelines. It's, if you really like sports, it's awesome. Um, but then when you start thinking, like um, it's, it's 
it's a big commitment because you're on the sports sidelines every year, every year, every year, and you're, and you're there a lot of the times. But if you like sports, athletic training is great. Physical therapy is great because you can take care of injured athletes and get them back in the game. So like, for example, I can, everybody hear of an ACL, anterior cruciate ligament? You tear an anterior cruciate ligament and you really can't play a sport that requires agility and extension, so you need it reconstructed. It's a, it's a relatively simple surgery to do, but the therapist gets you back in the game. So the physical therapist helps with that. And then there's all kinds of other therapists that you can do. So that's a broad, bird's eye view of sports medicine specialties that you can get into. And then there's like, you can go, you can be a biology major and become a PhD in physiology and then start studying the physiology of sports. Like, like, um, like for example, a lot of you guys don't know it, but up in Warsaw, Indiana, do you know that 70% of the orthopedic appliances in the world are made in Warsaw, Indiana? And so like, um, you start thinking, you go, all right, I'm going to replace someone's knee or I'm going to replace someone's hip. Well, what kind of forces go through an athlete's knee or an athlete's hip? Like how much force do you think it takes to cross your knees? How much, how much of your body weight in regards to force crosses your knees when you get up out of a chair? Well, do you know it's nine times your body weight will cross your kneecaps to get up out of a chair? When you're running up and down the stairs, nine times your body weight's crossing your knees, about five to six times your body weight crosses your hips. You start doing the math, you're thinking, man, that's incredible force that's going across those joints. And then you start thinking, like, how much air, how much oxygen does a runner consume when he's averaging X amount per mile? Well, physiologists study that. And engineers study that so they can come up with appliances. Like, like if you break your femur, you want to know that the rod that I'm going to put into your femur to fix it is not going to break before your fracture heals. That all has to be worked out. So people in engineering, people in mathematics, people in physiology, you can still enter the sports world. So, so there's all kinds of avenues. And basically the bottom line is if you want to enter sports medicine, there are so many areas that you can enjoy and have fun in that you shouldn't be limited by that. And you just let your imagination uh, go crazy, you know, and, and you can find a position in sports medicine. But, but let me just tell you how I got where I am. Um, you know, so my last name is Mindrabo, and it's, and it's my father's literally off the boat. When he was 16, he left Norway and, and came to the States. He had a half-sister that lived in uh, Mason City, Iowa. And he came in through Boston. And my last name in Norwegian is pronounced Mindrebe. And, 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 and my father was Magnus, the son of Soren. So Magnus Sorensen from Mindrebe. And that's it's such a hokey thing. But you know, everybody knew him as Magnus Sorensen. Oh, that's Soren's son, you know, Magnus. Oh, where does he live? He lives in Mindrebe. And so when he left Norway, that was his name. So our last name is a place in Norway. And there's a lot of Norwegians and Swedes that have place names as their last name. So he, he came to America. He, is, he was born in 1909. So in 1925, he came at 16. And uh, like, does, does, does anybody, has anybody ever studied World War II? Okay. You guys know about World War II, Hitler and all that stuff. Well, when the Germans invaded Norway in 1940, my dad joined the American army. And... Uh, you know, he was an officer in the war. He was, uh, he was a carpenter. So he was in the, uh, you know, he, he was in the uh, engineering division of the army. He would build the bridges and all this other stuff. And, and so he fought all through Europe. And after the war, uh, since he was Norwegian, Norwegians typically speak about three or four languages because it's a small country and they got to talk to the Germans. They got to talk to the English. So, so my dad spoke a lot of German. So he's involved in the reconstruction of Germany and fell in love with my mom, who was, who was German. And, and uh, the reason I say all this is because um, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a long story in my interest in medicine. But by the time I was born, I was the youngest of four kids. I was born in 58. I'm 57 years old. And so I was kind of near the tail end of what's called the baby boomers. So some of your parents may be in their 50s, maybe not. Uh, but, but we're the baby boomers. We, 
We were supposedly the generation that would change America. I think we changed it pretty negatively, but we changed it. And, and so uh, the, the only reason I say all that is um, my dad, like a lot of dads in my neighborhood, because I grew up in this apartment complex, were combat veterans. And, and you know, like uh, you guys have heard of Iraq and Afghanistan and all this stuff. I was in the Air Force for several years as a physician. The Air Force paid my way through medical school. That's how I got through medical school. And you've heard about post-traumatic stress and all that other stuff. Well, after World War II, they didn't talk about that. If you think about it, there were millions upon millions of combat veterans that came back to America. And it was really tough on them, but they all just moved on with their life. It was an incredible generation, but they had a lot of stress. And what do you think the drug of choice for combat veterans was for World War II crowd? Anybody have a thought on that? What do you think they took to handle their combat stress? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Alcohol was the acceptable drink. If you look at World War II movies, you know, the guys go to the party, they drink a lot. They also smoke a lot and all that other stuff. And so numerous guys, including my father, um, were drunk every day of their lives. And, and um, that was kind of a difficult childhood for me. You, like my brother was just in town visiting. He's five years older. He was the star baseball pitcher in our town. My brother is an awesome athlete. I played soccer and a little bit of baseball. But my, like, I was the younger brother. And so when I came along, everybody thought I'd play baseball like my brother. Now I'm just an average baseball player. I'm not a star like my brother. I don't know if any of that's happened to you guys, like where you have a sibling that's awesome and then you come along, hey, I'm just an average athlete. But, but all to say, um, there was not a day that I knew my dad to be sober. He would able, be able to hold a job, but then he'd be drunk. And um, my mom had been wounded by German artillery during World War II, and she ended up dying when I was six. So, so now there's four kids with a drunk dad in this apartment complex in New Jersey. And like my sisters gave me the message. They said, you know, the ticket out of here is education. And, and I took that to heart because I hated where I grew up. I hated our apartments. But, but the one saving grace that my father allowed us to do, and I don't know if any of this holds true to you guys or you know people like this, but my father, um, being Norwegian, there's a guy next door to us before we had to move into this apartment, before I was born, who was Norwegian. And this guy invited my siblings, my older sisters and brother, to church with him. And my sisters and my brother loved church because everybody was sober and people didn't swear. And it was pretty cool. And when we had to move to this apartment because of my dad's habits, my sister cried and goes like, how are we ever going to get to this church again? Well, this guy had a brother with four kids as himself that lived only a couple miles from our apartment complex. And for as long as I can remember, this guy would come and take us to church. And literally, literally it was like this. Where I grew up, all the dads were drunks. I'd go to church and all the dads were sober. And I go, man, whatever it is those guys have, I want. <coughs> and it was a faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ and Christianity. And I tell you that, that was a big part of my life to keep my act together. And <coughs> I would tell you, I would tell you, one of the things that helped me growing up was um, I kind of was smart enough to know, man, I don't, I don't want to touch this drunk stuff. I don't want to touch this cigarette stuff. Look at what it's done to my father. Look at what it's done to all these other guys. And whatever these guys have, I want. And man, I got to get straight A's. I got to study hard. And you know, my siblings and I have all talked and said, basically, we were fortunate that our parents were smart. My dad was smart. He just was a combat veteran. And like a lot of combat veterans in World War II, he was just drunk every day of his life. So it wasn't very good. But, but that motivation early on, my mom dying, then my dad died when I was a junior in high school from cancer. And you know, it was kind of crazy. We were pretty tight as a family. So my brother was five years older who was just visiting. He had just gotten married. He just graduated from college. And he was a PE teacher, health teacher, and his wife uh, was a history teacher. They, they were kind enough to move back to my hometown. Like, it'd be the equivalent of moving to Westfield so I could finish at Westfield High School. Because my dad died in February of my junior year. And the high school said, well, 
we'll let you finish out the school year, but for your senior year, you got to live with somebody who lives in my town of Lodi, New Jersey, to come back to Lodi for senior year in high school. Well, that summer, I worked at a church camp in New Hampshire, and I happened to break my neck in a water skiing accident. And, and it was kind of funny. It was one of the few times where, like, it was just, it, it, it's not funny funny, but just think about it. You're, you're about to be a senior in high school. So I went away to that camp, and I didn't know where I was going to live that fall. I didn't know if I was going to finish out high school with my classmates or what was going to happen. And then I, I had a water skiing accident where I broke my neck, and the camp didn't know what to do with me because I technically didn't have a home and didn't know where I was going to go. But it was my first exposure to an orthopedic surgeon. And this was back in the day where you guys would love to have been in sports medicine because so I break my neck, I got this neck collar on. I didn't get paralyzed. I felt the numbness and tingling and all this other stuff. But um, my brother ended up moving back to our town so I could live with my brother and his wife my senior year in high school. So I play, college, I play high school soccer, right? And I went on to play college soccer. So I show up to soccer practice with my neck brace on. And my high school coach goes, now this is sports medicine in the 1970s. Yeah. You can't play soccer with that neck brace on. And so I went home that night. I'm living with my brother. He's, there's no dad or mom in the picture. I take the neck brace off and go to school the next day and play soccer my senior year with a broken neck. Well, it was, it was stable enough then. As an orthopedic surgeon, I realized it was stable enough then. But my kids laugh at me now because my neck is kind of stiff. Like, I can't turn very far. But I got to play high school soccer. And those were the days where you didn't need a note from a doctor. So just to let you know, sports medicine has come a long way. You kind of you kind of need some notes from doctors and stuff like that. And I wouldn't advise anybody to play soccer with a broken neck. Headshots were a little difficult, a little. And if I would have known what could have happened with a bad header, and coaches would never let you do that anymore. But that's, but that was my first exposure. And so like I went off to college thinking, you know, despite the rocky relationship with my dad, he had died of cancer. And I was, going to go to, I was going to go to college and become a doctor and find a cure for cancer. That was my driving. I remember passionately. And then I broke my neck and I'm thinking, gee, those orthopedic guys, I don't really understand that orthopedics. <coughs> and the guy puts me in a brace and I go to his office and I don't really understand it. But I'm going to find a cure for cancer. Well, guess what happened my sophomore year in high school? I'm taking microbiology and studying cell biology. And guess what? you know, that was the first time I realized cancer isn't one disease. It's like, cancer is like, there's all kinds of cancers. So it's like, oh, there goes my, I'm not going to find a cure for cancer. And you realize, oh, man, there are so many different types of cancer. And I remember, like, going, I felt crushed. I go, what am I going to do now? I'm not going to find a cure for cancer. Because there are so many cures for, there are so many treatments. And it really turned me off, but I fell in love with anatomy in college. I really started to like anatomy, and I really liked physiology. You guys know the difference, anatomy and physiology? So, you know, when you're a science teacher, you got to be able to study something. So, you know, anybody dissect a frog? Do you guys still do that? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the frog is typically dead, you know, and you're, and that's anatomy, you know, you're exposing a dead animal. And, and so then you make, you study, and then you make, uh, you make postulates. You postulate that because the anatomy is this way, the physiology should be this way. But physiology is the study of living things, you know, how they're working. So anatomy and physiology go hand in hand, and it's really cool. And I really like that. And I kind of got the teaching bug, and I liked it. And so after college, I thought, well, I'll go into neuromuscular physiology and study neuromuscular phys. And, and that's where I got this master's degree at Villanova, and that's when I did the crab thing. <coughs> and then I said, ah, oh, man, I, I don't want to work on crabs the rest of my life. I want to work on people. So I punted and went to a place called Temple Medical School. Anybody been to Philadelphia? OK. So, Temple Medical School is on the north side of Philadelphia in essentially a ghetto. And um, back when I was there, like, you know, I feel bad for you kids because when I came to Indianapolis in 87, 
Indianapolis is a lot safer city than Philadelphia, but now you turn on the news and you hear about shootings and all this other stuff. And Indianapolis has caught up with Philadelphia, unfortunately. But where I went to school, in medical school, it was like the Philadelphia Knife and Gun Club. Like, you know, there were many charter members of the Knife and Gun Club, and there was some shootings and knifings going on. And as a medical student, you got to do a lot of stuff. And I had great anatomy professors. <coughs> and it was kind of cool to put people back together again and broke things. And that got me fired up. Neuromuscular fizz got me fired up for orthopedics. And so I said, orthopedics, this stuff is really cool. And so remember that ACL thing? You know, the anterior cruciate ligament? Does, has anybody heard of the Lachman's test? Okay. So you're watching, you're watching an athletic trainer. You're watching a team physician go out to the sidelines on an NFL Sunday afternoon and they're examining the knee. And you see those guys grab the knee and they check the knee and they go like that. You, you know what I'm talking about when you examine the knee? That's called the Lachman test. And it's, this is just, you'll, you'll hear it from me because I knew John Lachman. John Lachman was the chairman of orthopedics at Temple University School of Medicine. He's the nicest guy in the world, never married. All of his residents, up until the time I was in there, ladies, I'm sorry, but up until the 80s, most of the orthopedic docs in the world were men. Now, thank goodness, that's changing. There's lots of women. John Lockman was a good Catholic guy that lived in Villanova, Pennsylvania, Villanova University, good Catholic school. He taught at Temple. He loved his boys. He devoted his life to his boys. And he, he would show these guys on clinical exam, hey, I noticed that a guy's anterior cruciate ligament was torn if I did this maneuver. And he never wrote it up. And one of his former residents who trained there went on to, to to train at University of Pennsylvania, went on to teach there. And that guy became world renowned because <coughs> he, um, have you, anybody here play football? Anybody know about football? Do you guys know what a spear tackle is? That's what we talked about when you put the head down. Yeah. Spear tackling was outlawed based on this resident who had trained with John Lockman. He has all this video of football players, high school football players, hitting with the head, and they suddenly break their neck on the sidelines on a Friday night and be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of their life. And he worked out the mechanics. He did the spine models, the anatomy and physiology, and said, when you use your head to hit your opponent, you load your cervical spine and you break your neck and you're paralyzed. So they outlawed spear tackling in professional football and in amateur football based on his research. So that, there's an example of a guy seeing a problem, figuring it out, reporting the results, and changing the world, okay? But that same guy loved Lockman so much that when he wrote up the knee test that everybody does on the sidelines to test if your ACL is torn, he named it after Lockman and didn't name it after himself. But, but that's, the, that's the guy that, that taught me orthopedics that I loved, and then I came out here and did orthopedics. And like, Remember that situation with my parents and all this other stuff? It's kind of funny, after I graduated college, my sister goes, and when I was, got, was about to go to medical school, my sister goes like, uh, how are you gonna pay for medical school? I go, I don't know. And medical school ends up being very expensive. And my sister had joined the Air Force as a nurse. And my sister said, well, why don't you join the Air Force? And the Air Force had this scholarship program where they'd pay for your medical school if you'd go on active duty with the Air Force after that. And so that's, that's how I got through medical school, is on an Air Force scholarship. And so after I came to IU and finished up my orthopedics, I was an orthopedic surgeon for the Air Force. And I was, it was, you, you guys weren't even born probably. Yeah, you, you weren't even born. But in, 90, in 91, we had Gulf War I, where we invaded Kuwait and took it back. Well, I graduated residency in 92, so I kind of missed Gulf War I, and I was in the Air Force from 92 to 95, and I was stationed in little old Omaha, Nebraska, which is the home of Offutt Air Force Base. And I was orthopedic team physician there and all this kind of stuff, and then I came back to town after that in 95, back to Indy. But, but that's my story on how I got to orthopedics and how my family situation and stuff kind of helped motivate me to move on. And, and I would tell you, 
I tell you, surround yourselves, the, probably the most important bit of advice I can give you, surround yourself with positive people, with uh, people who um, have a hope for the future and, and you know, um, people that can kind of keep you out of trouble. I was very, very fortunate. There's a lot of guys I grew up with that got into trouble with the law and all this other stuff, but I, I was fortunate enough not to have that happen. And, I, I, and, you know, each decision you make has repercussions for your next. And the other thing I would tell you is uh, study hard. Like, it wasn't hard for me to study because I was doing what I loved. And, and you, know, th you know, you hear people talk about your sweet spot, finding something you love. And, and I can remember as a kid, you guys probably, have you ever heard of the Reader's Digest? So the Reader's Digest, you know, this is the days before computer, but they would have these articles where they'd say, I am Joe's liver or I am Joe's lungs. And you know, this was back in the 60s. Uh, and I was a grade schooler. And I would, I would go to a neighbor's house, the guy who took me to church, and he would get the Reader's Digest. And I would just read these articles about Joe's liver, Joe's kidneys, Joe's lungs. I was fascinated about anatomy. So this year, if you guys find that when you start studying the hip next week, and you go, you know, this is a pretty cool joint. Like, look, it's a ball and socket joint. And like, look at this knee. Now, well, that knee's shaped differently than that hip. Man, check out the elbow. That is a funky joint. And look at the wrist. Like, what are all those little bones doing and how do they work? And then here's the kicker. How many types of cartilage do you think there are in the human body? Any guess? There's, there's over 12 types, maybe as many, depending on how fancy you want to get. But the, the stuff that covers your joints is called articular cartilage. So articular cartilage that covers your joints. And here's the cool thing. The cartilage in your shoulder that makes up your shoulder joint is the same cartilage that makes up your hip joint, makes up your knee joint. The articular cartilage in all of your joints is the same. And here's the fun part. You go, genetics helps to determine what's going to happen to that cartilage, plus what you do for a living. Well, your teacher here, she was a champion shot putter in high school, in college. If you look at a shot putter and see what a shot putter does, puts a lot of stress on your hips. Add to that a little complexity of family history. And what does that mean? Well, just imagine Someone figured out all the steps of articular cartilage synthesis. Well, they're still working on all the steps. So you guys know about DNA? So DNA is the, the, the secret of all of what makes you. Like each individual cell has DNA that you can trick an adult stem cell into differentiate into any type of tissue in your body. Okay? That's, that's pretty cool. The DNA transcribes RNA which then goes and synthesizes proteins. Well, cartilage is made up of a series of proteins. Each little DNA gene codes for a specific little protein, which triggers an enzyme to make the protein to make your cartilage strong. There's so many steps involved in the synthesis of this, each step dependent on the next step to make a healthy cartilage. Well, what happens if you come from a family where like step number seven of the articular cartilage synthesis isn't as healthy as it should be. Well, that could put a risk at your hip joints. They could wear out. Why the hip? Well, it's subjected to different stresses than the knee. And the shoulders are subjected to different stresses than the hip and the knee. And now you start to understand why some families have hip arthritis, other families have shoulder arthritis, other families have knee arthritis. And you kind of go, whoa, this gets to be pretty cool. And then you start learning, okay, well, how am I going to fix those joints and keep people working? That's what really got me excited, and that's what made me study anatomy. And then what made me decide to be a surgeon is when you take all of that stuff together and you got to figure out how can I help a person without, without do it, with, with doing the least amount of quote-unquote surgical trauma to fix them. And then you start understanding how people that have lived 100 years ago struggled with the same problem and wrote articles and said, hey, you know, when I approach the hip, 
I went this way and I went through these muscles and that becomes a surgical approach to the hip. And, and now you're suddenly realizing, have you ever heard of this? That you stand on the shoulders of giants, that in your pursuit of an education, the wise person studies what's been done before, tries to learn what's been done before, and then takes it and tries to carry it another step. And in the end, all you're really doing is adding to the base of knowledge and realizing that just like you guys are sitting here now, now the only difference being is you probably have smartphones, you probably have computers, you probably can go and find out what happened in Kobe Wopi, Africa today by just going online where that wasn't possible 100 years ago, but students your age 150 years ago were in the same predicament trying to try to figure it out. But you live in the greatest nation of the world <coughs> with the greatest opportunities and you owe it to yourselves and to your fellow Americans and to the citizens of the world to be the best you can be and to study the best and to work as hard as you can to really learn stuff so that you can help people. Because it's it kind of excites me to see your teacher walking as well as she's doing and she's doing well and and you know she's had a really bad problem with her hips but now her hips have been replaced and and it kind of it kind of is cool when you're the when you're the doc on the field and you go out on the field and a leg is crooked and everybody goes that looks unbelievably weird <coughs> and that looks terrible like what, what am I supposed to do and you know what to do and you say okay Hey, let's take charge. Or think how cool it is, like when you enter into a room and someone has a heart attack and you know exactly what to do. And you know, boom. And, and you know, you keep your cool about it. And that's what's really, really cool about medical training and sports medicine. And so if you can get excited this year to think, hey, I'm going to get a basic knowledge in anatomy. I'm going to get a basic knowledge in sports medicine. And hopefully I'll have some practical steps where I can move in and splint an extremity if someone's broken a leg or injured an ankle. I can be able to help in a crisis situation. I will be the one who keeps my cool in a crisis. And that's what's really, really fun about what I do for a living. So that's my spiel. Does anybody have any questions? Would anybody like to look at your teacher's hips and see what they look like? On <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. Yeah. We can, why don't we put those up? Um, I don't know how it'll affect the lighting for you. Okay. Okay. Um, you want slide up? Not that one, those two. Yeah. But this is, uh, this is after your teacher's right total hip replacement. And this is her unreplaced left total hip that's since been replaced. Yeah, but, but like, um, here's something cool. Like, just, just think about it from this perspective. Have you ever looked at a femur? It, it looks like an I-beam. You know what an I-beam is? A steel beam that they, they use to hold uh, buildings up and buildings together. You see the curve in the femur? That's designed by God to increase the strength of that femur and to make it really strong. But you gotta account for that. Like, when you're designing something, your hip replacement has got to stop. The tip's got to stop before the bow and the femur. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems. But if you're trying to fix a femur fracture, you've got to have a rod with a curve in it that accounts for that bow. Otherwise, you're not going to fix the femur correctly. And you know, you look at the hip joint. It's a ball and socket joint. And you've got to come up with a ball and socket that can withstand stress. Well, just think about this for a second as you walk on your hips today, okay? Um, you know how thick the cartilage of your hips is? You, anybody know how many millimeters is in an inch? About 25 millimeters in an inch. So you have two millimeters, one twelfth of an inch of cartilage that covers your cup, and one twelfth of an inch of cartilage that covers your ball of your hip. When you lose that, you become arthritic and you have bone-on-bone -bone changes. See this hip? See how this ball looks kind of flattened and wide? And you see that black here? That's a big cyst in this hip joint. And this joint doesn't look crisp. And the bones responded, that's an arthritic hip that has no cartilage. 
So that's a, that's a picture of a person who would walk like this. And, you know, just think about what your hip does for you. It allows you to get to your shoes and socks. It allows you to move your leg. It allows you to do all those kind of things. And suddenly you see someone who can't walk, who has difficulty sitting and standing and all that stuff. And it, it, it really affects their life and they can't do things. And that, that can happen through a combination of genetics or a lot of injury, athletic injury. And when you look at a shot putter's form and the stuff they need to do with their hips, it puts a lot of stress on the hips and can lead to premature arthritis. So now remember I told you up in Warsaw, Indiana, all those engineers? Well, this hip was actually designed by guys from Memphis. So this is an Elvis Presley hip. Now, you guys know that Elvis Presley is from Memphis. And you probably, do you, does, it, does everybody know who Elvis Presley is? Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And if you look here, this hip fills the canal of the femur and grabs the bone here, and the bone actually grows into the prosthesis, and the bone actually grows into the cup, and this ball and this liner allow for the joint to move. And that provides incredible pain relief, better motion, and allows you to play. Now, does, ever, does anybody ever know who Bo Jackson is? Okay, so Bo, like, when I wasn't much older than you, well, like, there's this, there's this marketing campaign that says, Bo knows, Bo knows. And Bo Jackson was this, the first athlete that played NFL football and professional baseball. And Bo, unfortunately, took a bad hit, and he injured his hip so badly that he had to have his hip replaced. And Bo was the first professional athlete that went back to playing professional baseball with an artificial hip. And he lasted a few seasons, but, you know, it's kind of hard to slow down Bo because Bo knows. Bo, Bo's always right. Bo knows. But he burned out that first hip replacement by trying to steal bases with the hip because this hip is good, but... But your teacher, if you, start, if you start seeing her train for the mini marathon, or you start seeing her train to be um, like a triathlete, you say, ma'am, you may want to listen to your doctor and take good care of your hip because it's got to last you the rest of your life. Because that hip is good, but it's not strong enough for professional athletic, athletic activities. And now Bo knows, because I was reading a Sports Illustrated article about Bo, and after the bad tornadoes that went through Alabama a few years ago, Bo had a, he, he rode his bike through the state of Alabama trying to raise support and awareness for tor tornado victims. And Bo's on his third hip replacement. He's, he's worn out three hips because first hip he went back to playing baseball and he was still pretty fast with an artificial hip, but he wore it out. But, that, but that's an example of what we do. And here's the fun part about what we do. I had to study in medical school what articular cartilage looked like under a microscope. I had to figure out what, what muscle looked like under a microscope. I had to figure out all the tissues. And then how it all fits together in anatomy and physiology. And then, like, how do you do a surgical dissection and go through and not hurt the person and not injure their nerves and arteries and veins and other activities and not let them bleed to death or do anything because you're making these big incisions and how do you do it? Well, guess what? It's all been laid out and it's there for you to learn how. Like you could go home tonight and say, how do I do a total hip replacement? And you could see video that you would not want to see again, like if you're squeamish. And, and That won't be on our YouTube day. Yeah. And, and, like, and like basically orthopedics do you guys know about your bone marrow? Do you know that's where your blood cells are made of? And so I'm just going to dispel a myth just while we're here. You know, everybody knows about Halloween and skeletons. And you look at this skeleton, and it looks fairly harmless. And, and just so you know, this is made of plastic. When I was your age, they still had real skeletons around. Um, and they usually would get them from India or Africa. It was real kind of, but the skeletons were real. This is a plastic model, just so you know. But the skeleton typically, what do you think of skeletons? You think of dry bones and all this other stuff. Well, let me tell you, a living skeleton has an awesome blood supply. The bone marrow in the middle of your femur, and your, you want nice, healthy bone marrow because that's how your blood cells stay alive, and that's how your blood cells are produced. 
You know a red blood cell? You know what the life expectancy of a red blood cell is? Well, let me ask you this. In a human red blood cell, does it have a nucleus or does it not have a nucleus? Anybody know? Anybody know what a nucleus is? Okay, a nucleus is where the DNA is in a cell. And, that's, and then the cell makes, uh, makes all its proteins and stuff from the, from the nucleus. Well, a mature red blood cell in a human doesn't have a nucleus. Now, here's a trick question. Does a red blood cell in a frog have a nucleus or no nucleus? In college, it's the coolest thing. You could take the web of a frog, you know, the web foot of a frog, put it under a microscope, and you could see individual red blood cells go through the capillaries of the frog's web. And a frog red blood cell has a nucleus. So go figure. Why does a frog red blood cell have a nucleus and a mature human red blood cell not have a nucleus? You guys can figure that out in the years ahead, okay? But, but now, imagine if you were a doctor and you drew a sample of blood from one of you guys and suddenly they looked at it under a microscope and you had nuclei in your red blood cells. What do you think that could be a, a possible condition of? Have you ever heard of leukemia? or lymphoma. Well, in some of the leukemias of the world, you make all these immature red blood cells and they, they start circulating your bloodstream and they haven't had time to mature and lose their nucleus. And so the reason I say all that is to get back to the bone. If you break your femur in a car accident, like maybe going home today from school, somewhere in the country there will be a bus accident and someone will break their femur. Well, now that you're in sports medicine, you should know that when you break your femur, how many pints of blood do you think you lose from that? Any guesses? One pint, two pints, no pints, three pints? How many pints of blood do you have? The average person that weighs about 150 pounds has six pints of blood. You lose two pints of blood when you break your femur. The reason that's important is, say you're in a crisis situation, and a person breaks their femur, they've lost two pints of blood in their leg, so their leg will start to swell and their leg will be short and they'll have a tight leg. But more importantly, they'll go into what's called shock. You guys have heard of shock? That's called hypovolemic shock. Hypo means low, volume means low, and your, your blood count drops, your blood pressure drops, you start to get lightheaded, your heart rate goes up because you're trying to stay alive. <coughs> so. If someone comes into the emergency room with two broken femurs, they're really sick. They're on death's door. You got to stabilize them because their lungs are in danger of collapsing. So that's just an indicator of like, you come on an accident scene and someone's got a broken femur, they're in serious trouble. If they got two broken femurs, they're real in serious trouble. If they got broken ribs on top of that, they're, they're going to need to get to an intensive care unit within an hour or they're going to die at the scene. And now you start to understand, wow, knowledge is power. There's some simple rules that have been figured out by other people that, man, I just got to remember broken femur, got, they're, they're going to need blood, I got to stabilize this, they can develop all kinds of stuff. And now you start to get excited about medicine because, man, maybe you're, maybe you're thinking about sports medicine, you get into medical school, or you get into college and say, I want to be an emergency room physician, or I want to be a paramedic. Or I want to be fire rescue that goes to, to an accident scene and, and is in control of things. So there's, it's, it's just a, there's all kinds of fun areas where you can go and enter medicine. Um, but to get back to this hip, you have to know, you have to start knowing all this stuff and loving all this stuff. And, and, and so, so for your, for your teacher, it's kind of cool, but when you're doing a hip replacement, because of the guys that have lived before us and the gals that lived before us, there's three surgical approaches that you can do to the hip. You can make, you can go in through the front, you can go in through the side, or you can go in through the back. Now, does anybody know where your hip joint is? This is kind of, you know, you look here and you go, here's the hip joint. But, you know, ironically, your hips are right here, like right there. They're right there. And like, if you kind of do this, and you just kind of move like Elvis Presley, you can kind of feel those ball, the ball moving in your socket, but your ball and socket is right here, okay? So if I go in through the front, I get right to the socket real quickly, but if I go in through the back, it's really hard to get to the socket. And, you know, 
In another talk, I could tell you like, what are the pros and cons to go through a front approach? What are the pros and cons to go through a back approach? What are the pros and cons to go through a side approach? And you start learning anatomy and you start saying, huh, and you can become part of the conversation. You can say, well, you know, if I go through a front approach, there's this at risk, there's this at risk, there's this at risk, but the advantage to the patient is such and such. If I go through a posterior approach, there's this at risk, there's this at risk, this at risk, but these are the advantages. And, and that's the fun part about medicine. Knowledge, again, is power. And, and you know, you can, you can really make a change in someone's life, and you start learning these things. And so suddenly now, when you're at a family reunion or a family picnic, and something bad happens, you're Johnny on the spot or Joni on the spot. And you can apply a tourniquet, you can apply a bandage, you could say, hey, this is what's going on, this is what needs to be done. And, and you can be in control of the situation. So to get back to this hip, with the technology now today, there's a state-of-the-art ceramic head and a plastic liner that will hopefully last 25, 30 years and maybe longer. So that um, this will be the one hip replacement that, that your teacher will need. And so that's an example. Do you have another x-ray of the other hip? Yeah. Computer's angry at me. Yeah. Uh, this one, I think. Yeah. And so when we went back in, we, um, we replaced the hip with a pending. You know, we just, there it is. Now there's, there's the left hip, and you could see the difference in what the hip looked like before and after. Um, and so, like, like, if you think about it for a second, you know, you, Sometimes it's overwhelming being a high school student, like, like what am, how am I going to figure out the world? Like, what am I going to get into? But just think how cool it is with a hip replacement. I work with engineers who design these metal devices. And so, like, as an engineer, you go, what do you make it out of? Do you make it out of steel, stainless steel? Should we make it out of tungsten? Should we make it out, like, chemistry, you know, the periodic elements, all those elements, like what do we make this out of? And, and metal alloys, all that other stuff you could have fun figuring out. Um, so the engineers have figured out this hip's made out of titanium. Titanium is the same stuff that the military makes fighter jet wings out of. Why does the military use titanium on fighter wings? Does anybody know what the speed of sound is, the sound barrier? When you go faster than the speed of sound, you see the plane go by but you hear it after it passed by with what's called a sonic boom. When you go past the sound barrier, you start to catch the friction of the air, the atmosphere, and it heats up a plane wing. So like anybody flying a commercial airliner? Has everybody flown here or? Okay, so do you know what your commercial airliner is made out of? Aluminum. But, a, but, but if a commercial airliner ever went faster than the speed of sound, which isn't possible because it's not designed that, it would just burn up because the aluminum is not strong enough to withstand that. But titanium is strong enough to generate the heat that you see with that increased speed. But someone had to figure that out. And, and you know, that you could be the next designer of a military wing. And ironically, you know what's cool about titanium and orthopedics? So all your bones are held together by bone cells, okay? So individual osteocytes. So bone cells create bone, they make bone. And bone cells think titanium is bone. Isn't that amazing? So like um, this is a really good material to use for a hip because the bone can grow into it and, and it and the body just thinks it's bone. And why does it think it's bone? Well, there's an engineering term called the modulus of elasticity of the bone. It, it implies the flexibility of the bone. So like when we jump up, you know, when you start looking at your body, and you start looking at the different bones and the joints, each is designed for a certain function. So the shoulder is the most movable joint in the body because of the way the shoulder blade, clavicle, and humerus work together with the chest wall. So, you know, it's great at reaching up for doing things, but, you know, it's kind of hard to get your hip to reach up that high because it's more of a ball and socket joint encased in bone. So each, each bone and each joint has its different function. Well, the flexibility of a bone, when an athlete jumps up and down, you know, how come his bones don't break? The bones are flexible. You guys are getting a little bit on the old side, 
But my favorite flexibility story in sports medicine is this. <clears throat> One night I was on call at Riverview Health, and a guy comes into the ER from Carmel High School football practice. And this poor guy had caught his arm on another guy's helmet in a pileup, okay? And he was still growing. His growth plates were open. So that's another story for your bone. You know, you have growth plates when you're a kid, and then you're fully grown, the growth plates close. But football players had piled up on top of him, and it happened over a few seconds. He comes in with a quote-unquote broken forearm, but it's not typically broken like you see a crack in it. He's just got an arm in the shape of a football helmet, okay? So like he has this big bow in his forearm, so he can't go like this or this. It's in the shape of a football helmet because his bone literally bent as it broke. So you know what I had to do for him? I had to take him to surgery, and for about an hour, I had to unbend his bone from his wrist to his elbow. And you could literally, in a teenager, unbend your bone. It's the, those incredible things that can happen that happen ever so slowly. And so, so to get back to this bone cell analogy, the flexibility of titanium in the body is a lot like the flexibility of bone. So that's one reason bone cells think titanium is bone. But you know what happens? The manufacturers of titanium tried to make these plates that you put on the bone. So like you can fix ankle fractures with titanium plates. Some people are allergic to stainless steel. Does any girls here have a nickel allergy where you can't wear like certain jewelry because you get a rash around your ear or anything like that? Yeah. And you know, like for you, you would want to tell your orthopedic surgeon if you're broken anything and say, hey, you know, I can't wear anything that has nickel in it because stainless steel has nickel in it. And you can get this reaction to your bone. So for someone like you, they make a titanium plate to put on your bone if you broke your ankle. But the problem with titanium is the bone thinks it's bone and will grow over the titanium plate. And so like here you'll have an ankle fracture and you know there's not much between your ankle bone and the outside world. And then you'll get this hideous bone grown over your plate. And if you ever take out the plate and screws, you gotta chisel away the bone to get it out. But guess what they figured out? If they oxidize the titanium, so in chemistry you learn about oxidation reactions. If they oxidize the titanium, on the outside of the plate, the bone doesn't grow over it. Isn't that amazing? Someone had to figure that out. But those are the kind of things that, as you find out more and more about the unanswered questions that are out there, because there, there's tons of unanswered questions, you, you guys will be able to answer the next set of questions you know, in, in sports medicine. So are there any questions? Because I love questions, because the older I get, the more questions I have. So. I guess maybe I should turn the lights on so no one falls asleep, yeah. So you're going to study the hip. It's a ball and socket joint. And uh, do you, so I'm going to give you a little taste of sports medicine. Have you ever heard of a cam and a pincer? Okay, so um, in sports medicine of the hip right now, you saw that hip joint? Some people are born, instead of having a rounded head, they kind of have a block head. They kind of have a, a blunted head. That's called a cam. Um, have you ever heard of a cam engine? Like, a cam is this clunky thing. It's not round. And some people will have a cam deformity of their hip where when, like, you know, like in certain athletic maneuvers that gymnastics guys do and running backs do, your hips are out to here and doing all that other stuff. Well, if you have a cam deformity, the clunky cam bumps against the cup, and you'll tear the cartilage lip around your hip. So remember I was talking to you about articular cartilage? Well, in the hip joint and in the shoulder joint, there's this lip of cartilage around the joint called the labrum. So like, um, so you know, a football quarterback's throwing his arm back like this. He's ready to release the ball. <coughs> he gets blindsided, and a lineman comes up from behind and pulls his arm back like this his ball dislocates out the front of the shoulder. He's down on the ground. Oh, what happened again? And everybody's like, whoa. And his shoulder's like there. And like, then you got to go at the sidelines. You go put your foot in his armpit and grab his arm and pop, pop it back in. That's one way to do it. Hippocrates <laughs> described that, OK? We, we tend to do it a little bit differently now, a little bit nicer. But, but like, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, 
and the guy's got a dislocated shoulder and you're not going to get any tension, it's nice to know that someone in the past described you put your foot in the guy's armpit and gently pull on their arm, get them to relax, and you can pop the hip back in, or shoulder back in. But every time, like, everybody goes like this. Can you go like this? That's called the apprehension position, okay? And when you have an unstable shoulder, your ball right now is rubbing against your socket, and there's a lip of labrum, this lip of cartilage that keeps the ball in the socket. I liken it to like this. Imagine the socket of your shoulder is like an ice skating rink. And how does the ice stay in the rink? It's got that lip around the edge. Your labrum's kind of like that lip, and your ball is your ice skater. Well, every once in a while, the ice skater will like go as fast as he can and run right into the lip, break the lip, and off he dislocates. And that's how our shoulder dislocates. So you have this labrum that's around your shoulder socket and your labrum that's around your hip socket. So to get back to that cam thing, the cam goes up and clunks against the labrum, clunks, 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 and the guy tears his cartilage in his hip. And now he's got this piece of cartilage that's flapping in his hip joint. He says, Doc, you know, my hip's locking up, my hip's locking up. Well, you go in there with an arthroscope, you watch TV, and you shave the cam away. You, you actually shave the bone away and make it round so there's no cam so you can bring it up and you repair the labrum. And that's what your teacher had done, but didn't work very well. Her hip still became arthritic. That's a cam defect. There's a pincer defect. What do you think a pincer is? Well, on the acetabulum, the cup side, there's a point of bone right there when they bring the ball up to meet the, the cup, the pincer rubs against the labrum and you get this tear. And so like, you can be really cool in sports medicine when you go to like sports medicine meetings and say, yeah, yeah that athlete has a pincer defect of their hip. Oh yeah, 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 pincer, yeah. Did they have a labral repair? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now you can like hang out with like the ESPN crowd and say, yeah, like um, what's his name? My brother loves the Yankees. Oh, I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe I'm blanking on a third baseman for the Yankees. Uh, yeah, Alex. Alex Rodriguez had a pincer defect of his hip. That's, that's what it was, his hip surgery was. And you know, Alex has had a pretty bang up year this year. He's come back and the New Yorkers love him now. Um, but he, he's an example of a, of a professional baseball player who, you know, playing third base, running side by side, his, his hip would get a pincer defect. So those are, those are two things that can go wrong with your hip that you'll learn about as you study the hip joint next week, along with the arthritis and things like that. And then, and then like, just, just think about it this way. If you look here on the bump of your hip, see these little bumps here? Okay, so sprinters are in the blocks, and you suddenly take off or you try to jump over a hurdle. Well, right here, there's a muscle called the sartorius that attaches goes all the way down to attach to the inside of your knee there. And a guy can accelerate off the blocks or hurdles. He can avulse his sartorius right off the back, right off the front of his hip. And, and like if, you, if, you're, if you're a high school athlete, your growth plate at the sartorius can still be open. You'll have a growth plate fracture there. A lot of football players, okay, so right now all of you are using this. This is called your ischial tuberosity, is what you're sitting on right now. Okay, everybody thinks you're sitting on your butt, but those little bones that you feel there, that's called your ischial tuberosity. You know what attaches there? Your hamstrings, okay? What are hamstrings? Well, this is kind of cool. Someone named them hamstrings. What do you think they named them hamstrings for? Well, in the Middle Ages, when you carried a ham on your shoulders, you'd put a pole between the back of the femur and the muscles back there. And, and that, that was stringing a ham, you know, like you'd carry ham and the hamstrings were right, right back there. And like in the Middle Ages when the guys used swords and stuff like that, you'd hamstring your opponent, you'd cut their hamstrings, and then once you cut the hamstrings, you can't bend your knees and you can't walk. And so that was one way to incapacitate your opponent. But in football players, especially linemen, they can avulse their entire hamstring origin off of their butt they get this big bruise and swelling, and they have no power anymore. They can't, they, they, they've lost their hamstring attachment site. So we make this kind of interesting incision in their butt crease and go and reattach the hamstrings to their ischial tuberosity. So those are just a few sports medicine injuries around the hip 
that are just kind of cool. There are a lot of muscle injuries and tendon tears, not to mention fractures, and not to mention problems around the hip. So. Yeah. Had any questions. Yeah. yeah. When you were becoming a surgeon, did you were you able to specialize not specialize but able to try out other realms of surgery? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny uh, you uh, got to do abdominal surgery. Like I really I really like the anatomy of the chest and the heart and the abdomen, but but for me, I I just I just loved uh, the musculoskeletal system more than like, I thought about being a heart surgeon because I thought that was really cool. But, but, you know, in the end, it sounds so funny to say, I said, they just operate on hearts. Like, 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 like on, on, on any given day, I could operate on an ankle, a shoulder, an elbow, a hip, or a knee, and I'm never bored. You know, I just always have, have fun doing what I do. But that's, yeah, but you can try out other things. So I'm biased about orthopedics. So, hey, thanks a lot. It was real fun.